Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and uh, the Harvard Classics lectures. This is lecture number 80. We are engaged now in the Harvard Classics lecture number, volume number 17. The title of the volume is Folklore and Fable. We now turn to the tales from Hans Christian Andersen, the great Danish writer. Um, if you haven't been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, I very much recommend that you do so. Especially take a look at Harvard Classics lectures it's number 77, where I mess around with vol uh, volume 16. This is the Arabian Nights, Thousand and One Nights. And then uh, lecture 78, I did Aesop's Fables from volume 17. And then in 79, I did the Grimm Brothers uh, from volume 17. And now we're going to turn to the last of these stories that are contained in this volume, the stories of Hans, uh, Hans Christian Andersen. Um, I'm going to go back to the mantra that we have said a number of times in 303 that fundamentally, we are the stories we tell, the stories we retell, the stories we accept, and of course the stories we don't accept, the stories we reject. As we get into this conversation, let's remind ourselves about our learning theory, that the ability and desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. We again have our three levels of reading at level one, what does the text say at level two, what does the text mean at level three, how can I relate to this at 2A, themes, messages at 2B. Here we're concentrating on symbolism, archetypes, and the philosophic reading of, this, of these texts. I'm going to make the, arg the, the argument here in a little bit that the, the, uh, there's a reason why the great Danish philosopher Kierkegaard, and we have lectures on him elsewhere, uh, was so impressed with what Hans Christian Andersen was doing in his, in his stories philosophically. And then finally, at, uh, at level 3A, how can I relate to other titles I know? Disney and The Little Mermaid didn't tell the full story uh, uh, that, that we'll talk about in a moment. And then finally, 3B, how can I relate to this stuff personally? Now, of course, we've been looking, and we will do it again, we've been looking at all of these stories from their epistemological perspective, what can we know, from their ontological perspective, how do these stories tell us something about who we are as humans, from the psychological perspective and the individual mind, and what motivations stand behind those actions, and then, of course, sociologically, how do groups behave and act, and what are the motivations that stand behind those groups, and group inclusion. We'll see this in our study of the Ugly Duckling here in a second. And then the question of theodicy. Why is it that suffering happens especially to perceived innocents, those especially who are children, who have no reason to be punished for some of the things that will sometimes happen to them? Let's turn now uh, to Hans Christian Andersen and, uh, and, and just do a real quick biography here. His date, 2nd of April, 1805, to the 4th of August, 1875, roughly 70 years old. Again, we said he was Danish. A tremendous number of stories, some, some by some counts, 3,381 different tales translated into 125 different languages. It's remarkable, the success uh, this man had. So many famous, so many famous stories. Um, we'll have 20 in volume 17 here. He was an only child. Father gave him, interestingly, uh, A Thousand and One Nights to read as a young child. And in fact, I won't do this story, but take a look at his story, Flying Trunk, and you'll see something very similar to the flying carpet of The Thousand and One Nights. At school, and this is important for his biography, he was treated very, very badly um, in, in his upbringing. It was very repressive. And it's interesting, we're often going to see some of the pain of the dislocated and the alienated in some of his stories. Uh, his first volume of, of fairy tales in Danish, uh, Fantastic Tales, in 1837, his second one in 1838, Fairy Tales Told for Children, and then we had volumes that would come out after that in, um, in, in 1844, uh, and 45, 46, and then again in 48. He published, uh, finally, fairy tales right up until 1872, three years before he died. In early 1872, interestingly, he fell out of bed. And these are, these are weird stories, you know, the kind of stories of biography that kind of go, wow, I can't believe it. He hurt himself, and he never recovered from it. And in fact, ultimately, liver cancer took his life. He dies the 4th of August, as we said, 1874, at 70 years old, considered a Danish national treasure, and of course, a, a treasure uh, to the rest of us. Now, guys, I wish that I could do so many more of these stories than, I, than I, uh, I'm going to be allowed to do because of our lack of time. I'm going to take a look at at least four stories of Hans Christian Andersen. I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think these stories really do matter. And not only are they stories for children, which obviously they can be, but I think they're profound stories as well for us as young adults. And, and I think that 
you know, we'll come back to these stories later in our adult life as well, probably when we have children and we're sharing some. Let's begin with, I don't know, maybe it's the most famous of all of them, The Emperor's New Clothes, maybe the most famous story. I mean, it's hard to say, right? But certainly pretty much all of us have heard this story. Let's go through it again, though. We begin, first of all, with, uh, well, an, an emperor, but not a good emperor. I mean, he's very vain, he's very prideful, um, and he has a, uh, he, he has a, a certain agenda. Uh, the, the opening lines, many years ago, there lived an emperor who was so excessively fond of grand new clothes that he spent all of his money upon them, and he might be, that he might be very fine. He did not care about his soldiers nor about the theater, and only liked to drive out and show his new clothes. He had a coat for every hour of the day, and just as they say of a king, quote, he is in council, so they always said of him, quote, the emperor is in a new wardrobe. In the great city in which he lived, it was always very merry. Every day came many strangers. One day two robes came. They gave themselves out as weavers and declared that they could weave the finest stuff anyone could imagine. Not only were their colors and patterns, they said, uncommonly beautiful, but the clothes made of the stuff possessed the wonderful quality that they became invisible to anyone who was unfit for the office he held or was incorrigibly stupid. Those would be capital clothes, thought the emperor. If I wore those, I should be able to find out what men in my empire are not fit for the places they have. I could tell the clever from the dunces. Yes, the stuff must be woven for me directly. Well, dark irony, of course. These guys are going to pretend like they are uh, making him clothes, when in fact, of course, they're making him nothing and they're taking all of his money. You have people that will come and recognize there's nothing going on, and yet they'll say things like, oh, charming, quite enchanting, answers the old minister, for example, as he peered through his spectacles. What a fine pattern and what, and what colors. Yes, I shall tell the emperor I'm very much pleased with it. Um, another man. I'm not stupid, thought the man. It must be my good office for which I am not fit. It's funny enough, but I must not let it be noticed. Peer pressure. That notion of sociologically peer pressure. The ways that we will see things that aren't actually there. Because we have this sense that if we were to say out loud, no, this is actually not what's going on. Somebody might ridicule us and the like. Um, finally, the emperor will finally see these quote-unquote new clothes. What's this, thought the emperor? I can see nothing at all. He recognizes its silliness. That is terrible. And then, am I stupid? I mean, this is a profound story. He asks himself, am I stupid? Am I not fit to be emperor? It never occurs to him that he's just being taken, uh, you know, uh, by two, by two robes, by two idiots, right? It never occurs to him. Am I stupid? Am I not fit to be emperor? That would be the most dreadful thing that could happen to me. Oh, it is very pretty, he said out loud. Well, as you probably know, of course, in the end, it takes a child. So you got two chamberlains who were to carry the train. They stooped down with their hands toward the floor just as if they were picking up the mantle Then they pretended to be holding something in the air. Nobody wants to be considered stupid. So nobody will say that, in fact, there's nothing on this poor naked emperor. They didn't dare to let it be noticed they saw nothing. So the emperor went in procession under the rich canopy, and everyone in the street said, how incomparable are the emperor's new clothes. What a train he has to his mantle. How it fits him. No one would let it be perceived that he could see nothing, for that would have shown that he was not fit for his office or was very stupid. The power of a sociological pressure to say what is in fact complete, obviously, visibly silly. I see some of you smiling because... I mean, some of you have said this is high school or this is the university experience written large often, right? No clothes of the emperors ever had such success as these. But he has nothing on, a little child cried out at last. It is significant that it's a child, right? Just hear what that innocent says, said the father, and one whispered to another what the child had said. But he has nothing on, said the whole people at length. That touched the emperor, for it seemed to him that they were right. But he thought within himself, I must go through with the procession. See, notice the, 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 the irony. He, once he even notices, he can't admit that he was wrong. So he held himself a little higher, and the chamberlains held on tighter than ever, and carried the train, which did not exist at all. Think about what this story says about epistemology, and what we know, and what we think we know. Think about what it says about ontology, and who we are. 
and the idea that we define ourselves sometimes by something as silly as our clothing. Think about what this story, this story says in regard to the psychology hmm, and the way the mind works. And we can convince ourselves almost of anything. Of course, think about what it says about sociology and the ideas that are so powerful in our culture at large, right? Nothing seems to have changed. Think about what it says about theodicy and the, and, and, the, and the existence of pain and suffering. Notice we often create our own pain by virtue of our pride. Now the second story I want to look at is really one of the more remarkable ones, The Ugly Duckling. It's a, it's a story of personal transformation, first published uh, in November of 1843. Um, and it, uh, it, really is, uh, it really is a remarkable story. By the way, some of the stories of Hans Christian Andersen, he, he, he learned like the, like the Grimm brothers from others, but this is a story totally of his own creation, scholars seem to believe. And obviously, we often don't understand really who we are uh, or, or, or what we're capable of until we age. You'll, you'll remember in our study, Buildings Roman is the term that we use to identify what Telemachus does in the Odyssey, what young Stephen Dadalus does in Portrait of the Artist's Young Man, this coming of age story. And it's clearly, this is a, no, no doubt about it, this is I mean, clearly a, a coming of age story. Let's just take a look at, uh, just for a few moments, a couple of the, um, a couple of the lines and, and, um, and tell the story really quickly. Of course, the story begins with an ugly duckling. That is to say, a duckling is born who is hideous. Uh, they all come home. The poor duckling, which had crept out last of the egg and looked so ugly, was bitten and pushed and jeered. We're back again to the sociological reading, right? As much by the ducks as by the chickens. It's too big, they all said. And the turkey cock, who had been born with the spurs and therefore thought himself an emperor, blew himself up like a ship in full sail and bore straight down upon it. Then he gobbled and grew quite red in the face. The poor duckling did not know where it should stand or walk. It was quite melancholy because it looked ugly and it was the butt of the whole duckyard. So it went on the first day and afterwards it became worse and worse. The poor duckling was hunted about by everyone. Even his brothers and sisters were quite angry with it and said, if the cat would only catch you, you ugly creature, they wish that he was dead. Of course, the story will unfold. The young, the, the young duckling will try and find places to fit in. Never can find a place to fit in until finally it meets the swans. It flew out of the water and swam towards the beautiful swans. These looked at it and came sailing down upon it with outspread wings. Kill me, said the poor creature. I mean, this is an amazing story. I mean, think about this story as it relates to sharing it with children. Some of you will say, well, I don't know, this is a pretty mature story. I mean, I don't know if you should share this. The, the duckling has been so abused, it wishes for its own destruction. Kill me, said the poor creature, and bit its head down upon the water, expecting nothing but death. But what was this that it saw in the clear water? It beheld its own image, and lo, it was no longer a clumsy, dark gray bird, ugly and hateful to look at, but a swan. It matters nothing if one is born in a duckyard, if one has only lain in a swan's egg. It felt quite glad at all the need and misfortune it had suffered. Now it realized its happiness in all the splendor that surrounded it. And the great swans swam around it and stroked it with their beaks. We, we have often said in 303 that one way to answer the theodicy question, why do bad things happen? Here we hear it in this story. It is no longer asked, why is this happening to me? but rather learn to ask, why is this happening for me? And the brilliance of the story is that the swan finally finds his ability to make it in this world. Of course, he has to go through all the terrible experiences to, to, to try to get there. The last two stories that I'm going to mess around with, the Steadfast Ten Soldier and the, uh, the Little Mermaid, uh, both of these stories are brilliantly crafted stories for a number of, reading, uh, of reasons in our reading. I'm going to work first of all with the Steadfast Ten Soldier, very famous, turned into a, a, a ballet or two. Um, it's the first story that Anderson published uh, not based upon folk tale or a literary model, and for that reason I'm, I'm selecting it. Uh, a boy gets 25 toy soldiers for a birthday, um, and they're all cast out of one tin spoon. But the one soldier, because they ran out of metal, stands only on one leg, not enough metal to, to make him whole. 
the soldier sees a ballerina standing on one leg and falls in love. And then you've got this really interesting story where you have this kind of goblin figure, like a jack-in-the-box type figure, who will push the soldier out of a window, down into the street. Two boys find the little tin, tin soldier, put him in a paper boat, he's in the gutter, off he goes, down a storm drain, a rat, he meets a rat, a rat will demand a toil, in other words, all this bad stuff's happening to the soldier. Um, he ends up in a canal, swallowed by a fish, the fish is caught, and ironically, there he is, found in the fish, in the fish's guts, and he's back on the same table. Now, there's, he took this journey, and he comes back, if you will, to his Ithaca. Then, interestingly, the, uh, uh, a couple of boys, just being naughty, or maybe it's the goblin, he ends up getting thrown into the fire, and as he is melting down, a wind will blow the ballerina also into the fire with him, and so in the end they are together. And then a maid will find the soldier, and the soldier is melted down into a little tin heart. Um, just let me read you uh, the end of this story, because it's, so, it's such a beautifully crafted story. Then one of the little boys took the tin soldier and flung him into the stove. He gave no reason for doing this. It must have been the fault of the goblin in the snuffbox. The tin soldier stood there, quite illuminated, and felt a heat that was terrible. But whether this heat proceeded from the real fire or from love, love of the ballerina, he did not know. The colors had quite gone off from him, but whether that had happened on the journey or had been caused by grief, no one would say. He looked at the little lady, she looked at him, and he felt that he was melting, but he stood firm, shouldering his musket. Then, suddenly the door flew open and the drop of air caught the dancer, and she flew like a silk just into the stove to the tin soldier and flashed up in a flame and then was gone. Then the tin soldier melted down into a lump, and when the servant maid took the ashes out the next day, she found him in the shape of a little tin heart. I want to argue that this story is a profound theodicy. In other words, you can't always explain the pain and why bad things happen. And yet there's the counter argument as well, that no matter how bad things get, as long as you have love, you can have a way to get through those bad things. I'll make, in my final comments here, I'll make a final comment about the little sea maid, or the mermaid, as Disney will call it. This is not the story of Disney at all. I mean, we have a lot of the stories that are a part of that, of, of that story. Obviously, it's based on this. But there's parts of the actual story that are left out, especially the part that the little mermaid longs for a soul, and only humans have that. But to get the soul, she has to go through this process of making the prince love her. In the end, however, there is no happy ending here in that regards. Unlike Disney, she doesn't get the prince, but rather we do have an ending that seems somewhat, at least, um, you know, optimistic, in that she uh, turns into a soul, a spirit. The argument I want to make here is that both the tin soldier as well as the little mermaid want what they cannot have. They have to get used to this notion of disappointment, as the line from Princess Bride says, get used to disappointment. They have to get used to disappointment in their life. Well, think about what these stories are doing in terms of epistemology. They're obviously arguing you can't always know everything, right? I mean, the fallibilist position, epistemologically speaking, is the best one to have. Why? Because sometimes you think you're right and you, you, you're wrong. And, and, and it makes sense to hold that position epistemologically. Ontologically, no question, these stories all raise that notion of what does it mean to be a human? Note the irony. So many of these stories that I've talked about, notice the three last ones, they're not humans. They're ducks, they're little tin soldiers, they're mermaids. And yet children are being taught what ontologically? The human experience is an experience of pain. It is, a, it is true. It is an experience of often pain. But it's also an experience of joy and, of course, love. Psychologically and sociologically, these readings are profound. They suggest for us that psychologically there's motivations that stand behind our actions. But often those, as Freud argued, those motivations are unconscious. We're not always sure exactly why. Sociologically, the power of what others think and the power of deciding what is right and wrong contingent upon what others think. The emperor's new clothes demonstrates the foolishness of, of just simply blindly following what others have to say. But I think most importantly, 
These stories, and I think this is why Kierkegaard was so attracted to the stories of Hans Christian Andersen, these stories all speak to this question of theodicy, pain, suffering, and what is the value and the meaning and the purpose of suffering? And often, because we are the stories that we tell and retell, the stories we accept or reject, often we don't understand the profound influence of pain and suffering in our life until long after the fact, when we have become that swan or that floating spirit in the end of the story for the little mermaid. Well, my hope here is that you will find yourself reading more of this amazing writer and his stories, truly compelling stuff. And as you read them, I hope that you will find yourself seeing your own experiences and being challenged by this reading. Thank you.